Hey guys, welcome to chapter 8 on quantization. We're going to talk about the way matter and energy are quantized on a microscopic scale. And so let's, uh, let's talk about the fact that energy is chunky. First of all, electromagnetic energy always comes in chunks called photons. You can have uh, one photon or two photons or zero photons, but you can never have three and a quarter photons or... 6.87 photons. Um, photons always come in whole number amounts. And then uh, kinetic and potential energy of some systems is quantized. So an electron that's free to move in empty space is not uh, restricted to have any particular amount of kinetic or potential energy. But if an electron or any particle finds itself bound in a system where it can't get out, it, it's constrained to live in a certain region of space, then it turns out its kinetic and potential energies have to add up to only uh, specific, well-defined amounts. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't work. So uh, we'll see how that turns out in the hydrogen atom, for example, or in other situations. And, uh, of course, you, you recognize that matter is already chunky in the sense that it comes in particles of definite mass and charge and so on, electrons and protons and neutrons and so on. Um, but we're going to find out that its behavior has sort of chunky aspects as well. So let's go ahead and get started. And, and I think with some examples, you'll see what I'm talking about. So the first example is the hydrogen atom. It's an electron and a proton bound together. Because they're bound, it turns out the total kinetic and potential energy of the system can only take on values given by this formula, uh, the energy of the nth state that's allowed, the nth allowed state, is minus 13.6 electron volts divided by n squared, where n is one of the natural numbers. It starts at 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then so on. And if you make an energy uh, plot of the allowed energies, and you can see here also sketched in is the potential energy, you can see that the, uh, the allowed values uh, start at negative 13.6 electron volts, that's E1, and then E2 goes all the way up to negative 3.4, and then E3 goes to negative 1.51, and then the spacing between the energy levels gets quite small, as n becomes large, approaching uh, zero as n approaches infinity. But the, uh, so the low energy levels, one, two, three, and so on, have a large spacing, and the high energy levels, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on, uh, the spacing gets smaller and smaller and smaller as n gets larger. So the idea is the electron can be in state two, or it can be in state three, or it can be in state four, or state one, but it can't be in it can't be between those two states. It, there's no en allowed energy between negative 13.6 electron volts and negative 3.4 electron volts. There just isn't any place, any way the electron can be that seem that nature seems to be happy with. So that's kind of one way to think about it, at least. Now, electromagnetic energy, uh, which one form of which is visible light, turns out to be chunky all the time. You can only get uh, discrete amounts of electromagnetic energy, uh, which we call photons, or sort of chunks of light. Now, the energy of different uh, types of electromagnetic wave uh, vary quite a lot. The energy of a single photon of different types of electromagnetic wave varies quite a lot. So a radio wavelength photon has an energy of a millionth of an electron volt. Uh, visible photons have energies of a few electron volts, and X-rays have energies of 10,000 electron volts. Each one X-ray photon has 10,000 times the energy of a visible photon that your eye is sensitive to. And gamma rays uh, have energies that go from a million electron volts on up. So there's a tremendous range of energies associated with different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. And uh, this table just sort of gives you a sense of how those go. 
In the visible spectrum, the energies go between 1.8 electron volts and 3.1 electron volts. So you can see that that's an extremely narrow range of energies given the full electromagnetic spectrum, which goes from uh, basically zero to infinity. Uh, so um, now here's the thing. All waves, whether they're electromagnetic waves or water waves or waves of people waving their hand at a stadium in a, in a wavy way, be, obey a relationship between the wavelength of the wave, the frequency of the wave, and the speed of the wave. And to motivate that relationship, I got a little demo here I want to show. Okay, so this is a movie of a moving wave. Let me play the movie for you so you can see what it looks like. The wave just moves to the right. It's got a uh, relative amplitude of 1, which just means that when the wave is at 1 at the top of the plot, it's at maximum height or maximum value, whatever the value. It, it, for an electric wave, it would be an electric field, or a magnetic wave would be a magnetic field, or for a water wave, it would be the height of the water, that kind of thing. For a sound wave, it might be the pressure. And uh, the point is, as time goes on, the peak moves to the right, and the trough moves to the right, and uh, everything basically moves to the right over time. The time it takes, if you look at a single point on the wave, say look at this point right here, and watch as time goes on. That point goes down, and then that point comes back up again. So if you watch a point on the wave, um, it oscillates up and down. At any given value of x, the value of the wave oscillates up and down in time at that value of x. It's sort of like if you have a water wave and you stick a cork on the water. The cork doesn't move when the wave goes by. It just oscillates up and down. And the period of that oscillation is called the period of the wave. That's the period of the wave. The time it takes a point at a fixed location to go through one complete oscillation at that point. Now the distance between successive maxima in the wave, say the distance between this point and this point, um, is called the wavelength. And that's also the distance between this point and this point. And it's the distance between any part of the wave and the next time that part of the wave happens in space. So that would be from where it's going up and passes through the origin here to where it's going up and passes through the origin here. That's a wavelength, the distance between those two points. Now what's interesting is to uh, try to see if you can determine the speed of the wave. And what I'd like you to do is to focus on a peak, say this peak, and watch it move to the right and look how far does it go in the time it takes the next peak to arrive at the same place. In other words, notice that if I put my mouse at the location of the peak now, and then I wait, how long does it take for the next peak to come? It's a period. But then if you look, how far does the next peak move? How, do, how far does this peak move in the time it takes for the next peak to appear? You'll notice it's a wavelength. So the wave travels a wavelength in the time it takes for a single point on the wave to oscillate one full time. In other words, the speed of the wave, the distance divided by the time, is the wavelength divided by the period. Now, one divided by the period is called the frequency of the wave. So that means since it's the wavelength divided by the period, it's also the wavelength times the frequency. And that motivates the formula C equals lambda times F. For electromagnetic waves, in addition to that, it turns out the energy of the wave is directly proportional to the frequency. And since the frequency is the speed divided by the wavelength, you can write that as speed divided by wavelength times a constant or just frequency times a constant. The constant of proportionality is called Planck's constant. It's indicated by the letter H and it has a value of uh, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, an extremely tiny number. It is the tininess of this number which caused the chunkiness of energy and matter to go undetected until the early part of the 20th century, by, by and large, or the late, the late part of the 19th century. 
And uh, we're going to find out later that it's the smallness of this number that allows us to uh, ignore quantization in our sort of daily lives. So how does quantization manifest itself in the laboratory? Often, it does so through the process of emission and absorption of electromagnetic radiation. So when an electron jumps from one level to another, it either emits a photon or absorbs it. So when it goes from a high level to a low level, it'll often emit a photon with energy equal to the difference in energy between the two states that it's jumping between. And uh, if you've got uh, electromagnetic radiation in a cavity or in a region where there are atoms such that the energy difference between two neighboring states of the electrons in the atoms corresponds to a photon energy that's present in the electromagnetic radiation, then the electrons can absorb a photon and jump from a lower state to a higher state. That's the idea. Now they can they can only absorb a photon if they're in the state that has a higher state where the energy difference is equal to the energy of a photon in the radiation. But um, and we'll see how that works in the examples in class, but that's the idea. So in order to absorb a photon, you've got to have an energy difference between two neighboring states that's equal to the photon energy. And when you emit a photon, you emit a photon whose energy is equal to the energy difference between two neighboring states. So let's talk about temperature. Um, <clears throat> if you have a bunch of atoms or a bunch of things in a system that can, carry, that can take on different energies, the probability of having a particular energy uh, depends on the temperature. So uh, you can see the way this formula works, e to the minus energy divided by kT. If the temperature is very high, the probability of having a high energy goes up. But if the, prob if the temperature is very low, the probability of having a high energy goes way down. It goes exponentially down. So, um, Oh, and this constant out in front, this uh, P0, is just a so-called normalization factor. It, you can see that it's equal to the probability when the energy is zero. But uh, basically, we just adjust P0 so that the probability of having any energy, if you enumerate all the different energies and calculate the probability of all the different energies, they're all proportional to P0. So you can scale P0 so that the total probability of having any energy at all turns out to be 1. Now let's uh, consider a gas at low temperature. If you have a bunch of atoms in a gas at low temperature, basically the probability of being in the even the first excited state above the ground state is extremely tiny because the temperature is so low and the energy difference between those two states is so large that the probability of being in n equals 1, say, if this were a hydrogen atom, you'd say the probability of being n equals 1 is vanishingly small. And so all the atoms in the ensemble of atoms is, are going to be in the ground state. On the other hand, if the temperature is high, then the probability of being in n equals 1 or n equals 2 or n equals 3, it diminishes with energy. There is still an uh, exponential decay. But it doesn't diminish so quickly that the probability of being in these upper states is completely negligible. And so you assume that if the gas is at a very high temperature, that there is some finite, non-zero probability of being in these upper excited states. And what that means is electrons in those states can participate in uh, transitions that require them to start in n equals 1 or n equals 2 or n equals 3. But if it's at a low temperature, then the only transitions that are available are transitions where the electrons start in n equals 1. Uh, so they can go from n equals 1 to n equals 2, and n equals 1 to n equals 3. But they can't go from n equals 1 to anything, or n equals 2 to anything, because there's no electrons in any of those states, because the temperature is too low. And that's an important consideration. You'll see how that works when you do the homework problems. and. Uh, We've also talked about that in a couple of the warm-ups, but, uh, but that's the idea. Electrons can also be excited um, by colliding with other particles in the gas. So if you have, uh, if you have a bunch of high-energy free electrons that you 
bombard a gas with, they can uh, collide with atoms that contain electrons in lower states. And, and in that case, the energy exchange between the free electron and the atom is not quantized. I mean, it's quantized in the sense that the energy, the electron in the atom can only jump between uh, allowed energy states. But the free electron can take on essentially any energy. So that means that um, as long as there is sufficient energy for the transition to occur, the free electron doesn't have to have any particular amount of energy in order to contribute to that transition. Let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. If the uh, colliding electron, the free electron, has enough energy to uh, raise the energy of the bound electron above zero, then the bounder electron will essentially become free. And so that, that process is called the ionization of the atom. The atom can, the, the bound, previously bound electron can actually be removed from the atom and allowed to wander around. The, the atom then becomes an ion, and that process is called ionization. So let's talk about vibration. Uh, vibration is another kind of a bound process. You have a, a, say for example, an atom bound to a larger molecule and it can wiggle there. So it's kind of like a mass on a spring, but it's stuck, it can't get away. And the fact that it can't get away means that its energy levels are gonna be quantized. And so the vibration has a natural frequency which is just the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. It's exactly like a classical oscillator. But the allowed energies are not uh, just like a classical system. The allowed energies are limited in the sense that the difference between neighboring allowed energies turns out to be h bar times the natural frequency. Now h bar is a constant related to h. h is Planck's constant, the 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. h bar is simply Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Remember that omega is the natural frequency times 2 pi. h is the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So h times omega naught is nothing other than the old Planck's constant times the natural linear frequency. Omega is the angular frequency. H bar has a 2 pi in the denominator to compensate for the 2 pi in the numerator of uh, the angular frequency. So that's where all the 2 pi's have gotten to. But uh, a lot of times we don't want to mess with all the 2 pi's and so we use H bar in order to prevent us from having to use up a lot of chalk writing 2 pi's all the time. Okay, enough of that. So what that means is if you have a potential energy that's a quadratic, as in the simple harmonic oscillator, the energy levels will be equally spaced, and the difference between neighboring energy levels will be h bar times the natural frequency of the oscillator. And it turns out there is a smallest energy state, which we call E sub zero, that's the n equals zero energy. And uh, the book doesn't say it, but I don't see any reason not to say it, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you that that, for, for a simple harmonic oscillator, turns out to be a half of h bar omega zero. And uh, for a simple one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. You can think of a higher-dimensional harmonic oscillator as a, uh, a, a collection of one-dimensional harmonic oscillators, and we'll talk about that later in Chapter 12 when we get to that material. But that's the idea. So the main point is there is a lowest energy level, E0, and the difference between neighboring energy levels is always the same, h bar omega naught. That's for a classical, simple harmonic oscillator. Now, uh, you can think of a diatomic molecule as approximately a simple harmonic oscillator, at least at low energy. You can see that the potential isn't really quadratic. This is the so-called Morse potential. And the Morse potential looks roughly quadratic at low energy. But as the energy goes up, the uh, potential rises more slowly in the direction of greater separation and rises more steeply than quadratic in the, in the direction of diminished separation. And so while the simple harmonic oscillator approximation works well for the lowest energy states, as the energy level goes up, the spacing between the energy levels doesn't remain constant 
forever as it would in a purely quadratic potential. But the spacing actually gets closer together as you go up in energy, sort of reminiscent of the hydrogen atom. Um, but the math is quite different, but the qualitative behavior is not that different. So uh, a real diatomic molecule sort of behaves like this. The other thing a diatomic molecule can do is to rotate. And so it can spin around. And it turns out that that rotation, it's a bound kind of motion, and so it's also quantized. Anytime you have a bound system in motion, it turns out it's going to be quantized. The quantization is interesting in the sense that the separation between neighboring energy levels as the spin gets larger and larger actually goes up. But the energy differences are very small in most uh, realistic systems. And so if you look at the spectrum of a diatomic molecule overall, you've got the electronic levels of the electrons in the that uh, sort of the valence electrons in the molecule that can change energy states. And for each electronic level, there are multiple vibrational levels. So for example, at that top electronic level, there are four vibration levels that are shown. The middle one has four vibration levels, and the bottom one has four vibration levels shown. But each vibration level, each quantized energy of vibration, also has associated with it a family of rotation energy levels that are quantized. And so the full spectrum of a diatomic molecule has many, many, many energy levels uh, associated with rotation, vibration, and the electronic excitation, the, the different uh, electronic energy states like those of the hydrogen atom. So it can get quite complicated, but we're going to try to keep it simple and not make it too complicated. But, uh, but that's kind of how it all fits together. I just want to say a few words about the fact that uh, nuclei, we've been sort of ignoring the nuclei and talking a lot about electrons, but the protons and neutrons in a nucleus also have levels, sort of like the levels of electrons orbiting in atoms. And uh, protons and neutrons can jump from one level to another, and they can emit and absorb photons in a similar fashion. The difference, of course, is that the energy differences between levels in the electronic structure are electron volts. The difference in energy levels for a nuclear situation are more like millions of electron volts uh, so that the appropriate radiation to talk about when discussing nuclear transitions is uh, gamma radiation and uh, the other point is that neutrons and protons are actually composed of quarks and quarks can have different states just like um, electrons can in atoms and so protons and neutrons can actually given enough energy you can convert them into other you can give them other energy states and uh, the energy differences in those cases are so large that uh, people didn't recognize them as protons and neutrons anymore and they actually gave them other names but it turned out to be protons and neutrons with other energy levels and uh, and there's a whole world of particle physics associated with the different flavors of quarks and the different colors of quarks and how they work. But the, but the basic idea that you have quantized energy levels and you can tr make transitions from different energy states it is still sound, even in that rather more exotic uh, context. So that's basically it. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.